Okay, great. Um, so I thought for the uh, hands-on practical, um, a good idea is um, to apply some of the ideas that we have um, covered in the lecture um, and look at particular um, urban uh, forms and uh, neighborhoods and um, develop um, or just assess them in terms of their characteristics, in terms of sustainability and urban form. So within the um, folder, um, uh, you will find uh, the sheet pertaining to your group. Um, and at the top, there are a number of questions. Um, so the idea is that each group's got two um, neighborhoods um, to look at. Um, and um, the questions are, how would you describe the urban form of the neighborhoods? Um, and here, um, and you can think of um, di density, diversity, and design, and those different kind of indicators that pertain to each of those uh, dimensions. Um, which urban form principles, visions, or design ideas can you identify? So it's pretty much related to the previous one. Um, uh, um, walkability, diversity, and so on. So are there particular design elements that you can um, identify um, that um, probably enter into the um, planning process? Um, but then also um, think critically about how um, sustainable um, are these neighborhoods? Um, and are they sustainable? Might there be some challenges? Um, then, and then if you have time, um, you can think about very briefly um, which of the two neighborhoods you think is more sustainable, if you like, um, and um, maybe what changes would you make? Because that's very much what planners do, of, uh, right? When you when you look at neighborhoods, what changes um, would you make? What interventions are necessary to make the neighborhoods more sustainable? So those are the four. That's the task. Those are the four questions. You may not have enough time to do all of those, but I think if you do the first and just develop some kind of assessment and tell us how sustainable you think they are and um, what um, what kind of urban form characteristics you can identify um, that would be great and if one group finds okay, we could only look at one neighborhood and not at the second that's fine too so just to see how far you get I don't know, in terms of time, I thought about maybe 20 minutes in breakout rooms and then a few minutes for each group to report back. Um, each document has links um, to those neighborhoods. It's in almost all cases in a Google Earth link. And if it is possible, I think in the end when you report back, um, it would be helpful if you could share that link either through screen share or in, in a different way. So we need to probably check with Sid what's, what's feasible, um, but so that everyone can see what you were looking at. Um, that, that'd be great. Just select one of those perhaps in uh, the neighborhoods. Um, and you can share screen. Back. Yeah, share screen is possible. So that, yeah, that, that's great. Oh, okay, so, yeah. so I can't, can't really see three people. Right? Great, okay, welcome back. Um, and yeah, I would suggest maybe we just go through the groups in order. So group one, um, what did you find and how far did you get? Um, maybe I can kick it off and if any one of my group members uh, think they can kick in and add point, they can freely do. Sounds but, right, yeah. And maybe, maybe a few minutes, not yeah, yeah. I'll just give a brief. I'll just share my screen to, to just mute. Uh, Thank you. You can see my screen now. Um, so, uh, yeah, we had to look at uh, two settlements, uh, one in uh, Pasadena, Los Angeles in the U.S., and the other one in Rainer Valley in Seattle in the U.S. So the one I'm viewing now is uh, Pasadena. So um, uh, in com so I'll, I'll just give a brief uh, sort of view of both in order because we approach it comparatively in some sense. So 
uh, looking at the different settlements, we kind of uh, agreed that uh, this this one showed more of a compact, uh, dense uh, urban form where uh, larger chunks of buildings are there, and that probably points to potential mixed-use buildings. Uh, whereas in some cases, also we do view here some um, uh, this this sort of dispatched. Uh, uh, housing units, so it's quite mixed use in some sense uh, from our perspective. Uh, and uh, whereas the other one is is much less dense, uh, where mostly detached single story or double story units uh, are are there, which does increase the the commuting distances in in our perspective. And uh, in some cases, uh, the usage of cul de sac is is viewed and uh, basically that's for the the first question. So our views on how. Uh, this can be changed into a sustainable sort of uh, approach or which one is more sustainable is mostly a question of um, if we do look at look at it from uh, sort of uh, the view that uh, cities are, are, are containers we can sort of make this conclusion as the less dense um, or abide to this argument that uh, the, the denser cities are more sustainable in terms of transport uh, patterns uh, but then at the same point we had this concerned that we're actually just looking at the snapshot in, in both cases and that these are cities and open systems and they're mostly connected to, to, to external uh, areas. So uh, making really a conclusion on how sustainable they are is a, is a, is a complex question in some sense. Uh, so yeah, that's basically what we, what we do. So, Great, yeah. thanks very much. Um, yeah, and you, um, I think, you know, um, identified some of the key components um, um, of those two neighborhoods. And Los Angeles, um, or the Pasadena um, neighborhood is much denser. Um, and um, what's, um, uh, what these two have in common um, is the idea of transit-oriented development that is behind it, so where a transit line is built um, and um, connects a low density environment and therefore opportunities offers opportunities for densification within a relative low density environment. And Pasadena is a little bit more advanced in that respect, it's also been historically been denser anyway. Um, and when you zoom in and you go into the 3D view, um, you can see um, um, Exactly, yeah. If you go into 3D view, you can see um, the configuration of public space. You've got the um, um, metro uh, um, um, line in the middle, and then it opens up to public spaces. There are residential units around it, mixed use, a mix of private courtyards, um, open um, um, squares, and parks, etc. Um, and uh, which you can't see a subterranean parking parking lot um, too. So parking under um, underneath, invisible in a sense, um, and um, linked to the idea of park and ride as well. So this parking lot is particularly has reserved in the reserved area for park and ride. So here the idea of on the problem, which is very common in the US context, we've got a low density environment, which is often dominated by residential areas. Um, how can we, Densify and make it economically viable. And transit oriented development is a key component of that. And Rainier Valley um, is in Seattle um, similar, a much more suburban um, environment, um, but again built around a new light rail line, which was built in 2009, with the idea that this low density valley can be become densified. And if you look at the in the, at the back um, where the st uh, station is, you can see, if you go move further north, yeah, um, you can see um, exactly those developments around it, um, which um, is a level of density and mix that wouldn't be, couldn't be sustained otherwise in a low density environment. So that's very much a trend in the US to tackle the question of, you know, how can urban uh, be a bit more sustainable. <coughs> Thanks very much for that. Great, great, great summary. Let's move on to the second group. Please. Uh, who wants to share a screen? Shall I just yes, if that? possible. If that's possible, it'd be great. I'll just, I'll just start with this. Um, 
Did you see it? Yeah. It's coming up. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so we had a um, pretty uh, contrasting examples. Uh, one of this is uh, in uh, Fujisawa in Japan. This is this settlement, but which looks uh, pretty like private property development and uh, yeah, based on private home ownership. And then we had a second example. It's this. That is um, a newly built part of Hong Kong. Do you see that, everyone? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, which is um, ex yeah, obviously very, very well or very, very uh, densely built, um, pretty high rises. And uh, still, what we found is. Um, very uh, large, this is the, this is the map of street maps. And we found uh, pretty big patches of uh, green areas uh, within the, the built structures and also surrounding it. And, but still, yeah, also major um, mobility paths, streets going through this part. Mm. Sustainability-wise, we weren't sure which one we would prefer. We thought that uh, we were talking about walkability and um, mixed use. And um, we thought that this example of Hong Kong might provide more mixed use, uh, probably shopping malls uh, in first floors and ground floors. And um, the walkability could be working or interesting um, between those buildings if it's if it's nice. It's got nice green access. Um, and this the the other example could maybe be less walkable in the sense that they do not provide mixed use uh, in in this area specifically. And also that the street grid is la ra rather labyrinthic as, as a, a very dense form of urban sprawl. Um, yeah, so, but we weren't exactly sure because without having been there, you can't really estimate whether, for instance, on, on the, the side to this, you see uh, shopping malls uh, that yeah, do do uh, work for walking there. So, any any uh, additions from my group? Um, just that we noticed that they have solar PV on all the roofs there as well, which we liked. Right. And it looks like many um, bike pathways. Yeah. We we thought that these. Uh, blue lines might be uh, bike ways. Yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Right, thanks very much. And in fact, you know, your characterization of this being a dense, compact form of detached housing is, is spot on. So this is detached detached housing um, development, but much more compact than you would see it in, in Europe or uh, North America or Australia. Um, and, and the reason for this is that the plots are lower, uh, smaller, um, and um, there is actually very limited outdoor space for residents. And at the back, in between those blocks, you have a um, walking um, a footpath, um, which is public. Um, and um, despite the street grid being rather labyrinthic, and as it was pointed out, there's quite a high level of permeability for cyclists and um, pedestrians because yeah. of those foot footpaths that cut through these different blocks. So this was very much an intentional element of the design um, to you know, develop a human scale development that still allows for residential, um, for detached housing, and a degree of private space, um, um, and yet is um, fairly compact. Um, but as you also rightly pointed out, limits there are limits on diversity um, that can be achieved, land use mixing. I mean, this is absolutely, absolutely right. 
factories in this neighborhood was developed or co-developed by Panasonic, um, who were interested in smart city um, technologies and, and solar panels yeah, are very important um, um, element of this as you know a source of energy, but also smart TVs in each of the homes that you know at which you can be connected and, and also age friendly neighborhoods, which is an issue in, in Japan or particularly important in Japan. That was another important element of the design. So human scale, fairly compact for detached housing, but you know limits to you know uh, mixing and therefore still you know car dependent, but with strong emphasis on on, on um, walkability and through parks also um, um, you know self-contained. Now in Hong Kong, hyper dense environments very different. What combines the two, or what, what they share in common, is a strong focus on residents and, and um, it's some sort of yeah, satellite, almost a satellite neighborhood. It's part of the Eastern uh, New Territories in Hong Kong. Um, and as you uh, also rightly said, there are more opportunities for mixing. And in fact, there's a particular model in Hong Kong for uh, those new towns where you have usually an MTR station, so an element of transit oriented development there as well. Um, and then that is linked to a shopping mall, which forms the center of the entire satellite town. Um, and then it's dispersed, uh, it's um, interspersed by parks um, and wedges around the neighborhoods. Um, and so that is very much the idea there. High density, relatively high diversity, um, um, and from a design perspective, though, quite a challenging environment. And one of the issues in Hong Kong is that hyperdensity has been linked to question to issues of mental health because it's so hyperdense. Um, living space is very limited, personal li living space, and what um, is common in Hong Kong, so people use those kind of pocket parks and public spaces as an extended living space. Okay, so it's very much living space to the limit, um, um, to the minimum, um, and, um, and then an extended living space that is provided outside the home. And it's very much the idea. Great, thanks very much for, um, for the presentation. Um, group three, please. Hassan, do you want to share the screen? Yeah, just a second. Should I do, or do you want to do that? Uh, I can share, and then you can maybe. Um, yes. So we got um, um, an area in Amsterdam in Holland. Uh, Could we start with the other one? Yeah. Um, and then an area in Potsdam. I'm not going to try to pronounce it. Kirchdegfield near that um, in Germany. Um, so here we found there to be kind of. I wonder if we're missing part of the area now, Hassan, that, that area where there were houses further down. Can you zoom out maybe a little bit more? Um, medium raised uh, housing and kind of a medium density. Um, it looks to be largely residential and it seems to have quite a lot of suitable green area. Um, the fact that it seems to be largely residential indicates that people have to travel to go to work, which means there might be quite a high energy profile. Um, it seems that there's also quite a lot of cars. We couldn't quite agree on what is a lot of cars for this kind of area and what is not, but it's quite a lot of parking spaces around, um, indicating that people might be la largely relying on cars. Um, there's sidewalks, but we couldn't make out whether there's dedicating cycling lanes. We couldn't see any dedicated cycling lanes. Um, and in terms of becoming more sustainable, improving, we thought there's, we don't see uh, any green roofs or any solar energy on the, on the roof. So that could be an improvement as well as cycling lanes and also having a more mixed activity in the area. Um, more shops, cafes, but also potentially more commercial activities so people don't have to travel um, for work. Um, and then the other city in Amsterdam, um, we definitely decided that 
um, we found this area to be more sustainable, yet more potentially more vulnerable to climate change because of potential sea level rise. Um, but it has a lot of um, solar power, green roofs, cycling lanes, etc. It seems to be kind of dispersed, but high density at the same time because you've got kind of high buildings, um, mostly residential, we thought. Um, it seems to be next to an industrial area. Um, and in terms of improvements, the only thing we could think about was potentially more mixed activity, shops, cafes. We're not quite sure whether there already are quite a lot of offices and stuff because it's kind of hard to say, but it looks like it's more uh, residential than office space. Anything I missed, group? And uh, cycling lane There's also, like, we think is a cycling lane in this area. Yeah. Mm. Um, no, you mentioned, I think, everything. Yeah. Great. Okay, thanks very much. And so these are two examples from Europe. And what they share is um, they have been in part inspired by the, let's say, traditional ish um, perimeter urban block that's very common in European cities. So you've got an urban block, um, the buildings are moved to the perimeter, and then within there is space for a private courtyard. And in this example, in Potsdam, um, which is near Berlin, um, a um, in, um, um, parks, private private residential parks, but that can also be entered by by visitors. Um, now the scale of those two is different. So in Amsterdam, Eiburg, the area is intended for forty five thousand um, people, and Potsdam for five thousand plus people. And the Potsdam area um, is. Um, very much intended to be mixed use, but as you rightly say, there are only limited opportunities, primarily also because it is in a low density environment around it. In fact, the architects envisage this to be much denser. Um, so the blocks that you see right at the front, these those detached housing units, weren't meant to be built that way. They were meant to be perimeter blocks as well and potentially higher density that you can see in the, in the center. There's also been a design uh, limit imposed um, of five, um, 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 of five um, stories um, and only one building's got six stories, which is a landmark in the center of that neighborhood, which is a bit further up north. Um, and that's where some commercial activities cluster. Um, and here with the idea again with you know, some degree of self-sustainment. But as you, as you say, correctly, limited opportunities for offices, workspaces, people will commute into the city, um, and, um, but um, very much intended to be a more sustainable solution within um, you know, a low density um, environment. Um, very walkable, um, no bicycle lanes, but also low traffic volumes um, as well. And um, the traffic calming areas are very prominent in this neighborhood too. Um, and the other example, just another, um, um, just to point out the difference with Amsterdam, what you can see here is also, it's very, uh, what you're saying is absolutely correct. Um, one thing about walkability here, which is different from Potsdam, is um, the block size is much larger. So it is, in fact, um, more difficult to walk or to get to destinations quickly. Um, it's not easy to cut through blocks. You need to follow the pat grid pattern uh, to a degree. Um, and um, so you, you are encouraged to take a mechanized form of transport, which could be the bicycle in the Netherlands, the cycle lan lanes that you identified, um, but much less permeable than in the Potsdam context. The other thing to note here is that this is all reclaimed land. That's a reclaimed artificial island um, that was built to extend in the city of Amsterdam. Yeah. Great, thanks very much. Let's move to the last group, group four. Okay, so I will start with sharing our thoughts and then my teammates will join in. So we were assigned to um, different cities uh, in location and in social context, I think. Uh, the first one is uh, Asasol, Brasilia, uh, in Brazil. 
um, and the other one is uh, Milton Keynes in, in the UK. So we will start with, with the Brazilian city. So on, on the first look of the city, uh, we found the medium to high density buildings with lots of green areas, maybe similar to the Barcelona example you mentioned in, during the class today. But where instead of having the activities in the center, they were more between uh, the, the buildings. Um, the, we didn't see any public transportation uh, routes to be specific, but the area seemed to be uh, well organized and had a good uh, balance between green areas and the residential areas. However, when we uh, looked, we had uh, a wider view of the city. We found that this area and maybe this area were the only two that had this uh, design to them. The other areas had different uh, designs. So we were thinking that maybe this area was a newly built expansion in itself that was built to be more a more sustainable uh, city. It has mixed use, but it is not clear how it is connected to the other parts of the city as the city is, is huge as it is. Uh, the other example was uh, totally different, uh, Milton Keynes in, in UK. So on, on first look, we found that uh, this area which opens uh, the, the view is more like uh, a central economic and business hub. Uh, and then uh, the residential areas are uh, small buildings around it. Uh, the residential hub had many, many parking spaces with lots of cars. Uh, I think more than any of the other cities that uh, we have seen so far, which uh, made us think that maybe the, ma the main mode of transport in this city is cars. The, there are uh, uh, no other ways. Um, and then we, we also uh, have seen that there is the Willen Lake right here which made us think about uh, further development that this area should go uh, into more um, high-rise buildings or higher buildings than the current horizontal sprawl. Okay. So if any of the group would like to add something. Great, thank you. That, that was yeah, excellent. Thanks very much. And um, so, um, perhaps we're staying with Milton Keynes. Um, yeah, what you're saying about the transport system uh, is absolutely um, incorrect. So it is very much focused on the car. And in fact, one thing that was emphasized is speed. So that cars can actually drive at the national speed limit. And that explains why the roads, which are part of a wider grid system, are quite separate. Um, so those distributor roads that you can see um, um, with the roundabouts um, are quite separate from the built um, areas from buildings and that allows um, driving at national speed limit so they get move around quickly. At the same time, the city has a, a, what, it call, what it, it calls a redway system and these are completely segregated bicycle and walking um, um, paths that are not um, close to the streets um, that are you know um, organized in a separate uh, network um, so there is some focus some very deliberate focus on active non-motorized travel um, but what you're saying um, was also right you can see at the beginning which looks more like a business district um, this is the cbd the central business district of milton Keynes, which is very carefully planned and laid out in a grid but, and you alluded to it, it leads to an overall higher level functional segregation, okay, where you've got most of the commercial activities in a fairly vast center and then residential areas surrounded. So functional segregation, which is the opposite of diversity and mixing, and therefore dependence on large distance travel, which has to be um, you know, um, realized through the car um, in particular. Um, so that is absolutely right and limits um, for tra public transport systems to um, um, serve the area are, are very limited as well. So here an example of modernist town planning. Um, it's a satellite town built to relieve congestion in London during the 70s and 80s. 
um, and very much focused on the car, but with some some you know uh, some um, you know pedestrian needs and cyclist needs in mind as well. Okay, and this is a legacy now, again. Question, you know, you alluded to densification potentially, but probably one important strategy here is is really mixing and merging keen. In Brasilia, um, um, very quickly. Um, so here. Um, Again, um, and very much oriented around auto mobility. Um, there is very little um, evidence of public transport, although there is a fairly extensive bus system um, in the city. Um, and um, the interesting, or the particularly distinctive feature is the linear layout of the city, um, which despite larger distances makes a better or easy um, it can or allows better um, public transport service um, as well so a linear structure um, very heavily um, based on you know design ideas of mixing between residential environments and public parks and in fact it is um, um, it was constructed by an architect or by a group of architects influenced by Le Corbusier and Le Corbusier thought about super blocks Oh, we divide new cities should be divided into super blocks, which should all be self-contained. Should all have commercial activities, schooling, um, other services, parks, and so forth. And within that super block residences, people can um, live and, and shop and so on. Now, here the super blocks are very large, though, and again, therefore distances are very high, and people do depend on their car. Very interesting point you said about. You know, these um, surrounding areas um, and in fact although the individual buildings are fairly of certainly higher density than detached areas the spaces in between reduce the density heavily um, and there were um, controls basic building controls which were linked to that design so i think there was a maximum story height um, and um, the architects wanted to prevent informal settlements occurring um, within those area and therefore they occurred outside those areas and that's why it led to very strong you know, social segregation um, in, in Brazil. But this is a kind of modernist, again a modernist project, modernist vision of city very much based on automobility but also considerations of health, leisure in the immediate residential environment and some level of density. Um, but now from a sustainability perspective challenges in terms of mixing uh, but also in terms of human scale design walkability and distances so thanks very much for that so you, you identified um, in all of these um, key areas of design and the selection really i wanted to show you a you know reasonable spread from across the world um, uh, different types of urban form their characteristics um, and um, potentially also what particular challenges and priorities are. And we, um, so we can see you know, a huge diversity, of course, of typologies, which always need to be evaluated within the wider urban context. Um, and, and I hope that you found by thinking through density, diversity, design, um, and some of those indicators um, that you yeah, got a feel of how you might one might want to start evaluating existing urban forms and think about you know solutions um, that can lead to better energy efficiency and uh, sustainability and so forth. Are there any questions? Okay. Great. Cool. Then I think I don't know. I'm not running this but um i we, guess we can now move to the third session